So we have three guests. They they all gave me uh, great bios, and I'm going to edit what I read um, just for the sake of time. Uh, first is Brandon Ingram, one of our panelists. He's the owner of C. Brandon Ingram Design, award-winning Atlanta-based residential design firm, concentrates on custom homes, renovations, and architectural interiors. Draws from inspiration from classic and traditional architecture of the past, Brandon crafts homes rooted in history. Brandon is a South Georgia native. He's a fellow Georgia Tech alumnus, so he's already a good guy. Two-time winner of the uh, Philip Trammell Stutzi uh, design thing that um, SCAA does. We also have Liv Liz Davis uh, joining us. She is the owner of ESD Homes. Liz graduated from Miami University. Uh, she got the plan to go into the plumbing industry, but uh, we're glad that she ended up in construction. I have, um, her firm's recent work includes two 1921 Buckhead home renovations, both designed by architect Brandon Ingram. Um, she's renovated projects uh, throughout the area. I'm not reading their personal information, but I will say that Liz includes in her personal that besides her dogs and their husband and son, she has a gaggle of egg-laying fowl. Um, maybe we'll elucidate more on that at the end. <laughs> Finally, we have Wright Mitchell, who many of y'all know. Wright is the founder and past president of Buckhead Heritage. Currently serves as an emeritus board member for our organization. It's a founder of Mitchell Law, specializes uh, in historic preservation and civil litigation. <laughs> Wright is currently on the Lovett School Board of Trustees. He served as the Vice Chairman of the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation. He also served on the Board of Directors of the Atlanta Preservation Center and on the Governor's, Georgia Governor's Mansion Executive Committee. Uh, he's researched extensively about the history of Buckhead. And he's With that, I'm going to turn it over to Wright and Liz and Brandon. Go ahead. I want you to mute everybody. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you, Buckhead Heritage, for having us on. Give a little presentation about uh, historic rehabilitation of old homes. We somehow are not maximized. There we go. Um, and so the house we're going to be talking about today is a 1921 Neil Reed. And of course, I assume everybody on this call knows who Neil Reed was. But the principles of rehabilitation that we're going to talk about apply to any old home. It doesn't have to be necessarily a historic home. It doesn't have to be a uh, well-known famed architect. But the, you know, the, the principles of rehabilitation that we're going to talk about apply to anyone who has an old home and wants to make it more functional, functional and livable uh, for a modern family. So we'll go ahead and put up the, yeah. we're gonna put it up. We're going to give you a, a little he brief history of the house itself because I think it's interesting, especially you know, given that this is the Buckhead Heritage Society. But the house um, was originally owned by Governor Hugh M. Dorsey, who served two, two terms as governor of Georgia from 1913 to 1917, back when uh, Georgia governors served two terms. He was also the prosecutor in the Leo Frank case. Um, you know, maybe if we did a book, reason we did a book club on uh, the Mary Fagan killing, but Hugh Dorsey was the prosecutor in that case. And as a result of the notoriety he gave from that case, that was his springboard to the governor's uh, mansion. He served two terms as governor. While he was in office, he, the first mention of this home that he ultimately builds in 1921, there's Hugh, picture of Hugh Dorsey. 
Um, the first mention of the home that he ultimately built in 1921 on West Wesley Road at the time of uh, Wesley Avenue appeared in 1915 in the Atlanta Constitution. And he swamped land. He owned some land downtown. Back then, of course, you know, Buckhead was out in the out in the country. And so the homes that people were building in Buckhead at the time were country homes. So you would have a home downtown that would be your primary residence. And then on the weekends, you hook up the, you know, the horse and, and buggy and go out to your country home in Buckhead on Peachtree Street, which would, have been, which would have been a dirt road at the time. But in 1915, Hugh Dorsey swapped some land with uh, Floyd McRae. And many of y'all may know the Floyd McRae name was a long line of doctors in Atlanta, but Floyd McRae owned at the time about all of the land between Muscogee Avenue and Habersham uh, in Peachtree Heights West. And so Hugh Dorsey in 1915 swapped him some land that he owned downtown for basically that, that entire block on Wesley Avenue. And when he got out of the governor's mansion in 1917, he commissioned Neil Reed to build him uh, what is described in the Atlanta papers as a quote unquote country home. And so one of the cool things we found when we did the rehabilitation of the home, and actually my wife and Antonio found this signature, and she's on the call, I believe, but in, in an unfinished part of the attic, which had been, of course, you know, wasn't finished, so no light in there. This was a, the, a chimney that ran up through the attic that had been in a dank, dark space for, you know, 100 years, basically. And when we renovated the attic, we opened up this room and finished it off and put in lighting. And Antonia noticed that there was a signature on one of the bricks on the uh, fireplace. And so we started looking at the signature and said to ourselves, I'll be darned if that doesn't say Dorsey. So I went online and found where he had signed a document when he was a solicitor general. Uh, he was a judge in Atlanta uh, before he became mayor and matched it up and the signatures match almost identically. So what we have here is a, an actual signature of Governor Dorsey that he would have signed sometime probably when the house was being built in 1921. It was built in two stages. The first stage was built in 1921. The second stage was built in 1925. We're not certain why he did it in two stages like that, but the theory is that um, it probably he used it more as a country home for a while when he was living downtown. And then when they moved uh, in full time, he needed some additional space. And so they added uh, added on or finished out uh, the construction. Unfortunately, we've never been able to find blueprints of the home, which is uh, which is tragic. But we, we do know it's Neil Reed. Bill Mitchell, the noted uh, Neil Reed author, came out and helped us document that. Uh, it's job number 161, I think. Neil Reed did a number of houses for the Dorsey family. Lane's Inn, who that many of y'all probably know around the corner, was done for Hugh's brother, uh, Rufus Dorsey. But Neil Reed designed multiple houses for the Dorsey family. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is historic rehabilitation, but you know, there is historic rehabilitation that you do because you want to do it and you have an old home and you're interested in old homes. Uh, but there are also significant financial benefits that are available if you live in a historic district, a National Register district, or you live in a home that is either on the National Register or is eligible to be on the National Register. And Peachtree Heights West is a, a, is a National Register district. It's a neighborhood that has been designated uh, as a National Register District. So every conforming home in Peachtree Heights West or any other uh, National Register neighborhood is eligible for the state income and, ta and property tax credits. And those are, can be significant. So you get a $100,000 income tax credit and you can also 
get a an eight and it ends up becoming 10 year property tax freeze. And the property tax freeze in Fulton County ends up becoming more valuable than the $100,000 income tax credit because the rate at which the city uh, of Atlanta and Fulton County raise taxes, especially with the, the most recent assessment, you've got basically a decade where your value is frozen at pre-rehabilitation levels. So at the end of the day, the home that that we're going to talk about today, the value, the, the property taxes on that house, because it was a certified rehabilitation, are frozen at about a third of the fair market value of the house. So what you have to do to conduct a certified rehabilitation and uh, qualify for the tax credits is follow the Secretary of Interior standards. And all of this is monitored and overseen by the State Historic Preservation Office. You have to submit an application, you have to submit plans, and there are a number of things that you have to do to comply with their requirements, which we'll talk a little bit about. But generally, um, the Secretary of Interior standards are listed here. And you know, if we skip to five, is really where kind of you, you get into the meat of what, what is required. So any Distinctive features, finishes, construction techniques, or examples of craftsmanship that characterize the property shall be preserved. And so we'll talk about um, a really interesting thing that, that we did uh, that Brandon, how Brandon designed a master bath into an old sleeping porch. So one of the things that the historic preservation folks said to us was, you have to retain this sleeping porch. We were in desperate need for a master bath, right? And as you'll see, there was no place to put a master bath. But what we ended up doing uh, is it ended up going in the sleeping porch. But that is a, it, it initially we thought was a concession, you know, but it turned out to be one of the probably distinguishing, I think, signature features of the house. And so when you, when you start looking at what you can do with these old homes and you start looking at, you know, not what are the obstacles, but how can we do this in a way that not only makes the home functional, but how can we do it in a way that's really cool and really is sensitive, you know, a sensitive uh, rehabilitation historically, it, get, it becomes a lot of fun, you know, and so the, the first, you know, kind of rule is you, you, if it's if it's a distinguishing characteristic or feature, you have to keep it. Um, and any anything that can be repaired rather than replaced, you have to repair it. So if it's a wall that's, you know, kind of crumbling, um, what you need to do is go back over. If it's plaster, you go back over it with plaster. And we did a lot of that. Um, if it's wood rot, you know, you, you fix the, we have a parapet wall around uh, part of the, the house and there was a, it was completely rotted through and there was a question of whether we removed it entirely and put on what, uh, you know, the architect and we all thought might be a little more Neil Reed specific. There's some question whether it was, was a Neil Reed um, design in the first place, but the historic preservation people said, no, it's been there for as long as anyone can remember. You've got to not only replace it, but you have to put it back exactly like it was. So we basically just put in a whole new parapet wall that mimicked uh, the original wall that was there. Um, the, the rule of thumb is if you put in anything new, so if it's a new wall, it's not a wall that you've replaced, or it's not a window that you've replaced, but it's a new window, it's a new wall, uh, it's new molding, it's a new door. You have to distinguish it from the historic features of the home. And we'll show you some examples of how we did that. Um, obviously, you know, you don't want to use any sort of techniques like sandblasting uh, that would take off the veneer, uh, although they should sandblast that orange house across the street from, from us, which would be that box. See, Bob Helgett laughing there. He knows what I'm talking about. Um, I think that would be an appropriate sandblasting uh, use, but but at any rate, um, 
But yeah, it seems like limitations we actually yeah. I think had a lot of fun with um, mm -hmm. when we ran across an obstacle, which we'll start to see as we get through the photographs. We um, were able to use that to not only our advantage, but to make the house more what I think it was meant and intended to be. Yeah, that's right. So we're going to move on from the boring tax credit stuff and get into the to the fun stuff with uh, Liz and Brandon. And so, you know, Brandon was our architect and Liz was our builder. And, you know, I can speak volumes to why we chose them and why they're so great. But it really, it, it came down to, um, you know, a shared vision for the house. And in talking with Brandon and Liz, um, you know, this was a Neil Reed home that had been, you know, sitting basically Un, untouched for 20 years while we lived in it as a family. Wasn't and it supposed to be demolished at one point? It was, I mean, it was in such bad, we bought the home out of foreclosure uh, about in 2002. And when you, we were looking for, I was looking for a historic home. And if you find a Neil Reed home that's in foreclosure and they're willing to sell it for a song, you take it, even if you can't afford to uh, completely renovated at the time. And so we did that and we did the bare minimum uh, to make it livable. And then of course, uh, this was before we had kids. Then when we had kids, we began to run into, you know, all of the issues that you run into with a family, a modern family in an old home. And we finally got to the point where we realized we've got to either move or tear down and start over, or we've got to do a head to toe rehabilitation. And that's when we brought in Liz and Brandon. And so I'm going to turn it over to Brandon now to talk about, I mean, everyone's kind of familiar with the problems with old homes. You know, you've got small bathrooms, you know, small closets, you know, outdated kitchen, faces aren't functional lighting. So Brandon's going to talk to us a little bit about from a design perspective, how you fix those problems in an old house. Well, this house certainly had every problem that Wright just mentioned <laughs> and, and then some. Um, it was definitely and uh, it, it, it needed a lot of love, uh, but it was a Neil Reed house. And, and anytime you have the opportunity to, to do anything to a Neil Reed house, a Shutsy house, a Jimmy Means house, you know, you take those really seriously. I built a practice around designing new houses that, that have kind of a historic spirit, um, but especially in, in renovating old houses that, that need that historic spirit brought back out. And, uh, and this is a great example. Um, the, the image that you see on the screen now is, is pretty much what we were given when we walked into this house. It's, it's a very, you know, Neil Reed was always a master at, at scale and proportion. So the rooms in the Neil Reed house are always perfectly scaled. And that's certainly the case here. But this, this house had fallen victim to a couple of pretty bad renovations through the years. We don't really know who might have done these, or maybe we do, we shouldn't say names. Um, but but the, the real epicenter of what needed to be fixed and modified here was this kind of really awkward kitchen location back here in the back and a big kind of, again, awkward morning room that just no longer flowed the way Neil Reed would have had these rooms flow. Um, you know, knowing his work, I, I kind of, I think I have a good grasp on how he would have thought what he would have done. And it's very clear that this would not be it. We know that there's a sleeping porch that was above this kitchen. And so we know that this probably would have been a porch at some point. We're able to, to inherently go back and, and design things for Wright and Antonia that feel like they might have been Neil Reed's original house that was just more sensitively renovated. Um, upstairs in this house, you know, there's four nice bedrooms, um, but but here's this, this kind of awkward space that was a sleeping porch. Neil Reed did a lot of sleeping porches. Uh, a whole lot of those houses had that feature back when there's no air conditioning you'd actually go outside and sleep on the porch um but this had been converted into sort of a, a partial closet partial exercise room that really had some of the best light in the entire house so we knew there was a special opportunity there to do something um but as you see we were dealt these little bathrooms that just weren't serving the, the family that that was caring for this house um you know and just it's, it's an old house, it's a hundred year old house um, who needed some love. Uh, here's what kind of the, the images of what it looked like before we renovated. Um, very typical Neil Reed details in here, casings, window proportions, room proportions, uh, very much in keeping with what, what Reed did so well. That's front door is just, just wonderful, the, the lighted glass details. Um, 
you know, pretty and simple. Uh, this is a beautiful room in the back that had this incredible kind of plaster ceiling. Again, all things that we knew were, were fantastic, but they just needed that little turn of the dial to make um, even more fantastic. Um, pretty woodwork, pretty mantles, um, you know, lots of good stuff. It's just a, a complete diamond in the rough. Um, this also, uh, Neil Reed died in 1926. The, the second part of this house was in 1925. So this would have been one of his very last um, projects that he worked on. He died in February of 26. Um, so this would have been one of his last, which makes it even more special, quite honestly. Um, you know, again, just a quick glimpse into some of the details that we were working with. Just look at the, the scale and the and the proportions of these rooms, the ceiling heights, the size of the rooms, even in, in this condition, they're they're just really perfect. Well, and it really spoke to how some of the rooms were perfect for how we want to live today, but mm -hmm. they were missing just a few of the key elements, which Wright mentioned. Um, the kitchen needed to be a little bit more updated. Um, they wanted um, a mudroom, right? Sure, sure. Things like that. So this being a house that's 1925, it didn't have the things that, that families today need. It didn't have, like you said, mudrooms, places for kids to put book bags, but it did have beautiful rooms that we still use, like dining rooms. So a lot of rooms we didn't touch architecturally or structurally, we just cosmetically uh, attacked those rooms. Um, again, beautiful arch details and Neil Reed was so, um, so wonderful at. The stairs just beautiful. Yeah. I will say my wife's defense and my defense, these pictures were taken kind of during the, uh, the move <laughs> out, the move out process. Fair point. So, well, it's a good foreshadowing to um, mm -hmm. how beautiful it is today. Um, you know, we were dealt these original tile floors, original tile walls, and and we kind of learned the hard way that as much as you want to get sentimental, sentimentally attached to things like that because they're original, sometimes it just doesn't work and things can't be repaired and they can't be saved. Um, so there, there's a happy medium that you have to kind of align you have to walk on, on what's practical and what's not practical. So we ended up having to lose, unfortunately, this tile floor, but... Um, we did this, this was the master bathroom, so. The old original heating, the, the tiles are beautiful, actually, and it's sad to see them go, but. Well, the good news about the tiles is that um, a lot of those similar patterns and profiles are available and increasingly popular today. So it was very easy for us to find materials that were reminiscent of what might have been used and to make the house feel as if nothing had really changed yet it was updated. That's right. Um, this was that that strange little sunroom, old sleeping porch in the back. So just lots of windows. Um, again, like I said, lo great light, probably the best light in the house. So we knew something good had to happen in here. Um, just more of the same. Um, just a quick little glimpse through some of the bedrooms. Upstairs, more of that pretty old tile. Um, but but pretty to a point, but just not functional anymore. And that's when you know that a house just needs rescuing. Um, you know, telltale signs of an old house, floors that are creaking, floors that are cracking, um, plaster walls that are that are cracking and, and moaning and doing their things um, that old houses do. Um, Completely. Beautiful. This is one of my favorite parts of the house, which actually we, one of the few things that we, one of, one of many things actually that we pretty much covet. This, this was almost restored in place as it is. It's a very typical Neil Reed kind of butler's pantry detail, the big glass doors. He loved these little kind of column details and cabinetry. So we knew this is such an iconic Neil Reed moment that we, we preserved this at, at all expense. And you'll see some pictures later that show how we, how we handled that. This is that strange little morning room that I was telling you about uh, off the kitchen. Just kind of never really had a, a, a purpose or a function. Um, little moments of this kitchen. You can see it had been renovated many times through the years. And this was the kitchen that, that we were, were given. Um, so, so like I said, when I, when I get a, a project like a Neil Reed house, we take it especially seriously. And we, we want to do everything we can to, to honor what Neil Reed did so well, honor the house itself, and, and, and more importantly than anything, honor what our clients want. Um, I think it's important to remember that, that houses are not museums. And even though people that love houses, like Wright and Antonia, love old houses, happen to have one and take care of it, it doesn't mean they have to be, um, you know, 
held up by the house and limited in what how their family wants to function. There are ways to properly renovate a house and, and, and be respectful to the house, but still be respectful to the owners. So, so here's kind of uh, some of my original drawings that I presented to write in Antonia, what feels like 15 years ago, but maybe it was three <laughs> years ago. Uh, but where we have that, that problem space, we identify the problems in the old houses, uh, that strange kitchen, and we start to propose solutions. So in this case, keeping the footprint was critical because we, we just didn't want to change anything that, that was original to the existing perimeter of the house. So starting to think about how we might could reorient this kitchen. You know, maybe the kitchen goes here and we take this pretty light fill area and make that the morning room, the breakfast room. Um, you know, here you see the before concept and the after concept. We ended up taking this in a lot of different directions, but I thought it was kind of interesting to see the very first notion. Keep in mind that we actually kept this dining room exactly as it was. There's no need to touch what isn't, what isn't broken the stair hall, the foyer, exactly like they were. We just didn't want to want to be too heavy handed with any of it. Um, some of my early drawings of what that space in this, the kitchen that you just saw, the yellow, yellow kitchen, what it would look like if it were flipped and the breakfast room were in the back and the kitchen were in the front. Um, so we would like to keep things light and loose in hand drawings at this point so that so that clients and owners can really get the, the feel um, without getting too technical just yet. Um, another view, looking back toward what could have been a kitchen and being very careful to honor the scale of the millwork that, that Reed did, that some of the details and historic cabinets that he loved. So everything here is not just haphazard, let's just go design a kitchen in a vacuum. It's all very tailored and very specific to a Neil Reed house and more specifically this Neil Reed house. What I thought was so interesting about the kitchen in particular is that it was a fairly large kitchen. Um, but even by today's standards mm -hmm. that was in the home and what you were proposing was something a little bit smaller. We actually reduced the size of the kitchen. We sure did. And I think that was something that you even questioned at the time. Is this right? Am, am I going to feel okay with this? But in honoring the home itself, I think you can agree that it's a wonderful space and it fits perfectly with the yeah. home. Yeah. Well, what, what's interesting is many of y'all may know Richard Course, but Richard Course grew up in this house. And uh, Richard came over to kind of while, while we were going through this process to give us some feedback on what th what how he remembered things when he was growing up there. So this would have been, you know, in the 1940s probably. And the kitchen, of course, had been renovated and blown out into that big space. Brandon had already drawn up his vision for the kitchen, and it turned out to be almost exactly what what. Uh, what Richard Quartz remembered it being in the 1940s. So it would have been the way that Neil Reed originally intended it to look, which we thought was really, really interesting that Brandon basically had kind of come up with the same idea for that space that Neil Reed had. Um, so when we look upstairs, that same sort of problematic master bedroom in the, in the strange little exercise room and closet in what was a sleeping porch, you know, we started taking a look at what what we could do with these little bathrooms, little kind of tiny closets and that sort of thing. And we proposed originally having, you know, turning that sleeping porch into a proper master bathroom with a proper, you know, a, a suitable situation for a family that's that's in 2020 living in this house. Um, bigger closets, bigger, bigger, um, you know, bathrooms, that sort of thing. But, but again, being very respectful, not changing window locations, not changing anything on the outside whatsoever. Um, and then we start looking at even more options. So we're studying the whole time we're designing houses and projects like this. We're studying ways that we can we can be sympathetic to owners and to houses. Um, like I said, options, many options, schemes, directions. You know, what could the interior of one of these bathrooms look like? Um, these are again some of my early hand drawn concepts of of what a bathroom in a, in a sleeping porch might feel like. Um, yeah, I mean sometimes we hand draw toilets, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, you know, looking at cabinetry throughout the entire house, looking at kitchen details. I'm just kind of kind of going to blow through some of these drawings, but you get the, the feel that we're we're gradually moving from concept and loose drawings into real technical things that are being incredibly um, conscious and cognizant of of the specific house that they're in. Um, and then here's where we kind of ended up with our with our final permit set of drawings. Um, which we'll see some fine, final pictures or finished pictures in a moment. 
Um, one of the things that, that we had to be very careful of, mainly because of the, the tax credits and the, and the Department of the Interior, is, is if we wanted to change something or add something to this old house, we had to be very careful to make sure that we didn't make it look like it was original. So things like, we had to document all of Neil Reed's mill work, his casing profiles, his baseboard profiles, his crown profiles, and not reuse those. If I was gonna put a new door into a room that had some of Neil Reed's mill work, it had to look like Brandon Inger mill work and not Neil Reed mill work so that somebody could go through and identify that this was original, this was not original. And that's honestly counter to the way I do a lot of renovations where we want everything to look like it might have really happened at one time or a, you know, an earlier renovation. But it, it proved to be a really interesting direction. So here we see Neil Reed's profiles and the profiles that I ended up using that were just slightly less elevated than Neil Reed. The last thing I wanted to do was try to go on top of Neil Reed. You never do that. You stay below the radar when it, when it comes to Neil Reed. And we had to, to submit all of the drawings to the Historic Preservation Office and they would review them and say whether you know what we wanted to do is acceptable or not acceptable. So there's a fair amount of back and forth with them just making sure what we wanted to do uh, met with their approval. Sure. But even the details like down to the interior doors had to look a little bit different if we were to try to make an interior door that was new to the home. And Brandon helped us figure out a, a subtle way to make a different door that worked really well mm -hmm. with the rest of the home. So for example, the, the doors in the home, the Neil Reed doors are four panel, is that right? So I think or they were six, 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 six panel. panels. So the ones that, that we put in had to be four panel. Mm -hmm. We just enlarged some of the panels, um, but using similar um, similar profiles so that the doors really worked well together. And you'll get to see some of that in the finished spaces. Yeah. So I'm going to let Liz talk about some of the challenges of actually implementing and building some of our design solutions. So Liz, you take the, okay. take well, the lead. I could probably speak for hours on, on all of the challenges, but um, I like to sum them up into a couple of different categories. I mean, first and foremost, the systems of a home are generally not up to snuff with how we want to live today. Um, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, all need to be looked at purely for the safety of the homeowners, as well as the structure of the home. Um, in this case, we're looking at the attic of the home, and it was... Um, included in the spaces that we finished out. So this is actually living space now for the homeowners, um, but it was a, a snarl of HVAC that was running through. But we ran into some real gems like this window that's at the end here um, that we believe was uh, originally facing Peachtree Road, correct? Would have, yeah, the house would have been the first probably on West Wesley on the mm -hmm. approach from Peachtree, which would make sense why you'd have this ornate window uh, which now just basically faces into the house next door. Yeah. And Wright gets to have his office here now. Um, and this uh, brick fireplace um, is exposed for him to look at. And there's just lots of interesting detail in that. And that's where the signature is on the fireplace. Oh, yeah. I just want to Leave it to Neil Reed to put a big, beautiful window in an attic. <laughs> Um, but you can see some of the, the challenges that we had and in getting HVAC run um, a little bit more properly. We were um, going through walls and uh, moving ductwork, um, being careful not to take apart flooring um, and structural elements until we needed to. Um, this enabled us to really thoughtfully figure out how we were going to take this house apart which is probably one of my key um, points in this is that you can't come in and demolish a home like this all in one fail swoop. It was weeks and weeks of peeling back and seeing what layers we had, what needed to stay, what needed to go. I think um, our demo crew um, called this the house of stairs, the stair master house is yeah. what they called it, up and down the stairs with um, buckets and um, trash cans. Uh, but lots of insulation over a hundred years that needed to come out of the home. You could just feel the home starting to breathe as we were taking apart all of um, the just old elements that were there. But we've uncovered um, not anything um, really worthwhile saving in the attic other than the structural elements. We were hoping we'd find something, but I guess we found a few tickets and things, didn't we? Yeah, some, some pretty cool stuff that had fallen through the attic floors and we actually found where the house had been, that we built basically two houses almost next to each other. We found the seam uh, between the 1921 edition and the 1925 
1921 original construction, 1925 edition. And we found a signature that I think yeah. one of the um, the original builder had signed and put the year of the home on, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. This is an attic fan, um, a view of the, the home as it um, looks today still with a different color. Here you can see the seam. The, the, oh, the, the seam right It's here. funny, when you drive by this house, just a quick glimpse past West Wesley, you think of it as a very symmetrical, kind of typical Neil Reed colonial house, but it's really anything but symmetrical. Which, which was a was a little bit of a head scratcher for me. But you can see that the left side, where the porch is all the way over to the left, would have been the 1921 version or construction. And everything to the right, the four windows to the right of the porch, would have been what was added in 1925. And we think it's at that point that the three dormers were added as well. So, so again, it was kind of Neil Reed. I'm, I'm sure it made him twitch also that it was never symmetrical. Um, but it's also kind of part of the attitude of the house that it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's not overly academic, which is what I love about Neil Reed's work, that it's got a sense of lovability in its imperfectness. And we had to really honor and, and not try to make what we were doing too perfect because this never was intended to be that perfect house. You can really see the asymmetry if you look at the window directly above the front door. You know, it's, it's clearly off. And you know, had you built that house all at the same time, that window would have been about either, either it wouldn't have been there, it would have been two or three feet to the right. Mm -hmm. And you, there seem, if you look at the gutter, if you see the gutter going up the front of the house, it's actually hiding the seam where the, the two houses basically sit next to each other. It really was fascinating taking apart the layers and you truly could see the seams and the floor structure of, of one house ending and the next one beginning. But what a stately home. So this is um, showing what we did structurally for the home. Um, we obviously had a structural engineer that guided us through this process and it included many visits from him personally as we were taking apart the home. Um, this was uh, to re-support a bathroom that was above and we used um, laminated um, structures as opposed to steel here, um, really just because the sizing worked out really well. But you can see that we were able to save all of the plaster walls and get these structural members in place. Um, we had the arduous task of matching back multiple layers of drywall that had been put on the ceiling and getting all of that elevation correct and back in the finished product. We kept the crown molding in place. Anywhere where we could keep things in place, we did. Right. Um, we put electrical, ran through the baseboard, so we didn't have to cut holes in walls. Um, this was just an artful, um, time-consuming demolition. It's another view of that, where you can see the fireplace, and this is the living room. And so much of this is not, uh, it, it's not even, um... Neil Reed's fault that houses sag, that, that his houses, there was just not the same construction technology in 1925 that we have now. He didn't have the, the advantage of laminated beams and steel. Uh, well, there's still, but but so a lot of this rehabilitation was, was just taking advantage of what we have now and offering it up to a house like this that needed it. Absolutely. This window you're looking at here had been walled in. So when we bought the home, that was a solid wall. Um, for some reason, someone thought it was a good idea just to, to put uh, sheetrock over it. <laughs> but, and the terrazzo floors had carpeting. Yeah, right, right, the floor had uh, carpeting glued down on it. <clears throat> but back to Brandon's point, um, the, in terms of the structure, when we were taking apart this home, we often made the comment of, how is this even still standing if right. we use today's lumber and available materials, there's no way the structure would have stood. But with 100-year-old lumber that was obviously of better quality than we probably have today, um, this home was in really good shape considering its age and, and time. They truly don't build them like they used to. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Not at all. Um, this is a screen door that we ended up um, saving and, and finding and putting back. Here's another example. See, this is the, um, the piece that Brandon was talking about that we were able to save. It was um, plastic off during most of the renovation. Um, all the flooring was removed um, except for you know, directly underneath it. 
We exposed all of the, the plaster you can see came off walls where we could. And we ended up putting an entire new floor system in this space um, just because it had been opened up and added on to so much that we needed that for the structure of the home. But I love the vision of old um, and then new coming in right behind it. All the bathrooms um, were, as, as was typical in the time period, were all poured concrete on slabs of wood. And it was very thick, in some cases, nine, 10 inches thick, that all had to come out. Um, we exposed galvanized plumbing um, back to systems that just needed to go. Um, galvanized plumbing systems are really not very healthy for us. Um, the, the metal starts to um, deteriorate into the drinking water. So if you have a galvanized system, you really should look into replacing that. Um, so it's time for a historic rehabilitation. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's some steel going into the home. Um, and that's a really cool shot. This is from the basement. This is the first floor. Um, and that's a, a jack that's holding up a steel beam as we framed around it. The kitchen floor was sagging noticeably. You could see the, the sag in the floor. It just had been uh, not properly um, renovated and it had a couple layers of tile put over it. Um, so it was all fixable and we were still able to save the elements, which is, is I think the big takeaway here is that you don't have to go, come into a home and completely tear out everything and start over. You can keep some of the elements and, and work around them. It just takes a little bit of thought and planning. Here's the um, sleeping porch as we started to put it back together, put the plumbing in place. Ooh, and then uh, we're gonna and get into the finish. we start talking about the, the finished product. So you saw some of the early drawings of the kitchen and you saw where that original kitchen was. It was big and, and quite honestly, a little bit obnoxious in, in its size, right? <laughs> but so it, it, in taking it and giving it a scale that's more kind of in line with what Neil Reed would have done, you could almost feel like this was a renovation of Neil Reed's original instead of a whole new kitchen. And that's kind of, that was kind of the goal of all of it. Simple detail, simple millwork. The interior designers did a phenomenal job of picking the right materials, the right faucets. Um, you know, here's what was the kitchen. This is now the morning room. Uh, great light. We actually kept um, the original windows. This was a window that was hidden behind the refrigerator. Right. Um, so it was there the whole time. These windows were always there. We just kind of worked around them. And so it, it gives you still when you're in this house, even though it's the systems are new, everything behind the walls is new, you still feel like you're in an old house. Is it, the window would be a good example of, of, of something that the historic preservation folks said we had to keep. If you notice, the window is about, you know, chest level, which is not, <laughs> you know, the way Brandon would have, right. would have designed the window there. But because it was the original window in the kitchen, uh, we had to keep it. And yeah, it's a little bit higher than you would, you know, want it to be, but it's quirky and it adds to the character and it's an interesting talking point in the house. That's right. Uh, new butler's pantry, kind of scullery areas that are, that are so nice um, and also feel historic. Um, here's another view of that kitchen. Um, you know, again, we kept things super simple. This was, we were not trying to have some fancy, you know, over the top, designer kitchen. It's all very mm -hmm. humble. It's all very um, tasteful. And, and it feels, again, like like a space that might have been an original Neil Reed kitchen. It's just been updated. Um, this is a dining room where I mentioned we really didn't do anything other than clean it up, just make it, polish it. We, we redid the plaster in here. We had the mantle, Neil Reed's mantle uh, redone, reworked. This original pink marble is, is absolutely beautiful and so special in this house. Antonia uh, hand polished a lot of the unlacquered brass. So props to uh, Antonia for spending hours with um, brass uh, unlacquering. You know, I think hardware in an old house is really one of the most special parts of it. When you think about some of the knobs in this house, Neil Reed actually touched them. The, the Dorsey's actually touched those things and they really are relics of, of the people that live there. Um, that pretty stare, you saw the before pictures, but, but you know, we kept it just like it was, but just sensitively, turn the dial and, and just kind of polish it up a little bit. That yellow living room that we saw before is now this beautiful, serene, pale blue. Um, again, the same beautiful light that comes in from a Neil Reed window. Um, but we didn't change the scale at all. Like. Changed nothing in here other than decorative. You know, Neil Reed's mantle was cleaned up. Um, this is that, that pre-room where we saw the, the old terrazzo floor still there. Beautiful new wallpaper, the interior designers selected. 
um, again, just great spaces, great light. Um, this is that room that, that we were seeing before with a pretty plaster ceiling, uh, just completely rehabbed, not renovated, not touched. There was no heavy handed architecture that went in here. We just honored what was there and, and let it be. Um, it's pretty fireplace, um, beautiful detailed. That pretty Neil Reed arch door leading into the powder room. Again, exactly where the powder room always was. Um, here we see that um, that sun porch again, the sleeping porch. And here you'll see kind of my concept early on, on how that might look if it were a bathroom. And here's the actual bathroom. So you saw that you saw the original, you saw the, the demo process, you saw the design process, and here's what actually is to Wright's point, one, probably one of the most special places in the house. The light in there is phenomenal. And the fact that when you're when you're using the bathroom in the morning, getting dressed in the morning in this space, you get the light, you get the views, you're in the back of the house, you're up high. And it's a perfect example of a solution that you can get to in a renovation that you would just never get to in a new house. And it's, it's interesting because the historic preservation folks kind of made it, forced us into this solution in a sense, and it, and it turned out to be great. Yeah. They said, you cannot touch that sleeping porch. And so we all said, well, how are we going to get our master <laughs> bath? And that's what it became. Yeah. So, you know. Back to the point that when you're given a chance to exercise a little bit of creativity and a, and a lot of thought and planning on the, the front end, a renovation like this can't happen without a good team of people in sure. place that are all thinking about what's best for the home and how to make it what it, it became. That's right. Yeah, it, it would, if, we, if we'd had a builder that wanted to take shortcuts or an architect that wanted to just, you know, take, uh, take, you know, take whatever liberty to make it functional, you know, it wouldn't have worked. We had a great team of people who all really, I think, felt like we, I know I do, I feel like I'm a steward of this home. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Liz and Brandon both, you know, really, you know, felt like they, that we all owed it, as strange as it may sound, to the home and to Neil Reed to do the right thing, which was to uh, do a very intentional, thorough, historic rehabilitation. That's and right. at the end of the day, we were successful and we got the tax credits and the tax freeze. But, you know, it was much more than that. It was a it was a very rewarding experience uh, for the three of us working together uh, as a team uh, with Antonia, my wife as well. But I want you know, I think the the takeaway from our from our presentation is that, you know, even if you don't want to pursue the tax credits or you don't have a home it's in, um, you know, in a national register district that you can take these older homes. And what happens a lot of times is people just say, well, you know, I don't want to go to the trouble to go through the process of rehabilitating it, or they can't, they don't get the right people involved um, to help them figure out how to make the home livable. And these houses end up getting torn down. And we see it happen in Buckhead all the time. And it doesn't have to be that way. It takes the right team takes some creativity and it takes a certain amount of, you know, it takes the right kind of owner, person that's willing to uh, make some compromises and, you know, their day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, comfort or living or however you want to say it, but it, the, the benefits far outweigh the drawbacks. And it's not just a home like this that, you know, you have to have to do uh, a, a historic rehab. That's right. And, and it's going to show us another project he did. Well, they're, they're not all Neil Reeds and they're not all Shutzies, but, but every little town in America is, 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 is littered with, with houses that were once good and are just kind of, they've fallen into disrepair and they just need, it's a lot easier to tear a house down than to renovate it, but it's not always the right answer. And here's a good example I'll show you. Again, not a Neil Reed house, a very typical 1950s house. This one's out in Griffin, Georgia, where Neil Reed did a lot of work, actually. Jimmy Means did a lot of work in Griffin as well. Um, we were charged with taking this house and making it something special for its new owners. Um, and so sticking with completely the same footprint, completely the same, you know, uh, room arrangement, basically, we turned that into this. Um, and it literally, it just takes thinking outside the box. These are, these are things with, with right in Antonia's house, with this house, that you never would get to if you were just given a blank slate and a piece of land that says, let's go, let's go build a house. Yeah. So you go through like Garden Hills or Peachtree Hills, you know, they would take that ranch house, a lot of 
builders and they would knock it down and pop up, you know, McMansion. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it could be sitting in John's Creek or Alpharetta or it doesn't matter. That's um, right. And you've lost a sense of place. Yeah. You've lost a sense of the personality of the house. But in doing so, you've also really damaged the, the fabric of the neighborhood. And I think that's part of being a sensitive old house owner is respecting not just your house, but respecting right. where your house is and what role your house plays in its community. And that, that happens with a 100-year-old house, a 50-year-old house. They all have a history and something that has the potential to be honored. Sure. Here's the old, this old living room. Again, typical 1950s, a little acoustical tile ceiling. Um, and we turn it into to this. Um, just being very sensitive and, and careful and intentional with, with everything we did. You know, picking up the good things and keeping those good things, like this pretty old mantle that was there. Um, there it is now. Um, beautiful little corner of this dark living room. There it is now. Um, you know, so, so they don't all have to be Neil Reed House. They don't all have to be Chutsies and, and, and name brand houses to, to deserve to be saved and have good potential to be saved. And they don't always show you the answer right away. And I think right. that's another po important point of this process is that it truly was a process that we all had to stick in together. There wasn't ever a point where I felt that I was just left to my own devices. I was constantly working with Brandon, the engineer, with Antonia and Wright, trying to make sure that we were building something that was appropriate and taking the care that we needed. Um, but it was also really fun. I learned so yeah. much along the way. And um, I think that's what made the team work really, really fun. Sure. Um, yeah. 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 Well, beautiful work. Yeah. So <laughs> great project, great team of people. And um, we appreciate the opportunity to sort of share it with you guys. We very much do. Yeah. Any questions uh, from the audience? John, I think you're yeah. muted right now. How tall were the ceilings? So they were probably originally 10 feet, but they had put that, what they would do is, and then Liz can speak to this, but in a, rather than put in new plaster ceilings, they would just put in another le level of drywall. So we had the, the ceiling heights over the years have been diminished about a Mm -hmm. about a foot because they just rather than put in a new plaster ceiling they would just add a line there so yeah it was the, it was a case in maybe yeah. how not to renovate in some cases um you know, covering up and and not trying to to expose and make sure you're you're starting from a good state is, is always a good idea but we were able to in some cases like in the kitchen um yeah you gained a lot of good space for sure yeah the house i mean Liz can, can, you know, she said there was a Stairmaster house, but they must, they took tons of, of debris out of that house that was from previous construction projects, renovations that, you know, for example, in the bathroom, rather than, you know, take up the tile floor, they would just put a new one over the top of it, which added, you know, uh, weight on the ceiling below. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I think that was a lot of the structural issues that were going on this home was just some some um, heavy, just too much, too much weight. Um, so I really felt like the house took a big deep breath when we yeah, got all yeah. the demolition done. Um, and I, I mean, I'd go as far as to say that it, it just, it feels lighter and more airy um, just because of that weight being lifted. A question. Brandon, you might want to turn off screen share. That might prompt the phone. Oh, sure. Yes. Great idea. There we go. If anyone wants to unmute themselves, they can ask a question, or you can type a question through the chat and we'll. How long did this project take, guys? So, from start to finish, it took about two years. Um, could have been we lived in the house and Liz had been trying to usher us out for quite some time, but. We started with the attic and we kind of lived there during that project, which slowed things down. But I guess a, a good question for Liz would be if you had that house with no 
no one living in it, how long would that have taken start to finish? I would say anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And really the, the process is just um, because it took a little bit of time to, to go through the demolition and answer some of the questions that we had. Um, so maybe 12 months on the, on the, a pretty average amount, but it could be up to 18 months if you have a little bit more or um, need to take some time going back and forth with different um, structural folks and whatnot. Which is about how long it would take to build a brand new house. True story. Right. One of the questions was, when did Peachtree Heights West become a district? Was that in 2005 or six? Uh, it was before that. It was, um, I don't, I don't know the exact date. I want to say it was maybe someone else on the call knows, maybe Richard knows, but I want to say it was back like in the seventies, maybe. I don't know the exact date. What surprised you guys the most in this process? I was surprised that Wright and Antonio would actually go for it. <laughs> I couldn't believe they actually did it. Uh, I was surprised at how much it really changed their lives. Um, I knew Wright and Antonia um, a little bit on a personal level before we started. And just watching how they live their lives now and the, the sense of pride that they have for their home um, is just unparalleled. I don't think that I've, I've ever worked with another homeowner that has so much joy that is brought to them by home. Yeah, Liz has said that we were kind of basically camping before we did the, <laughs> the rehab, but it's true. I mean, we had lived with this, you know, home that we love, but had completely, you know, kind of fallen apart on us. Um, and, you know, doing a head-to-toe rehabilitation is quite an undertaking. Um, so yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that yes, it is much more livable and enjoyable as a home, but I think what surprised me the most about, you know, the process was, you know, how, you know, trying to do things the right way from a historic rehabilitation standpoint, instead of the most expedient way or the easiest way ended up being the best way and made the house, you know, uh, made it, you know, what it is, you know, had we done things, for example, had we not gone for the tax credits, you know, the master, uh, we might have closed in the sleeping porch to create a master bathroom, for example, we wouldn't have left it like it is. So, or we might have added on, like that's yeah. a typical, um, I guess, way to solve a problem is just add something yeah. onto the back of the home. And in this case, we, we really were limited by the fact that everything had to stay within the right. four walls of the home, if you will. Yeah. So sometimes limitations can be the best surprise. Yeah, it, it, what I was saying earlier, it, by, by trying to do it in the most historically sensitive way that we could, it turned out really awesome and better than if we had just said, okay, let's just do it the, the quickest, easiest way. Let's add on, let's, you know, just let's fix the problem and not worry about what impact it has on the historic integrity of the house. That's right. In, in, in all seriousness, I was joking about, right, Antonia, actually doing it. In all seriousness, seriousness the thing that surprised me the most is, is how conducive a Neil Reed house always is to renovation. They're, he designed and built houses in a way that, that just, they, they make it easy. They tell you what they want to do. They tell you what they need to have done to them. And despite having had a whole series of, of, of not so great renovations under this house, it was pretty easy to take it back to what it wanted to be. And it still surprises me when I go in their house now, it, it still feels like an old house, despite the, the years and the months of work that went into it and the demolition and the right point, the tons of things that came out of it, it still feels like a Neil Reed house. It still feels old. And that's really what we wanted from the very beginning. Yeah, it was a timeless house and it needed a timeless, you know, rehabilitation, which is what it got. Yeah. Right, I think we had a question about how the 1920, how the two renovations original built came about. And I think you said you didn't really know the history of that, is that correct? Uh, we, we don't know. I mean, we have a lot of oral history on the home um, and, that's been passed down through various owners. Uh, 
the Bevington, uh, the family was originally owned by Hugh Dorsey, and then it was owned by a couple of families that you might not know the name of. But then the uh, the Bevingtons, Paula Bevington and Milt Bevington, excuse me, the Court family lived there for 20 some odd years. And then the Bevington family lived there for 20 some odd years. So we have a lot of uh, history that's been passed down. And I had always heard the house was built in two stages, 1921 and 1925. But that was purely just based off of what I had heard from the previous owners. And until we actually went in the attic and you know, blew out, took out all of the, the sheetrock and everything. Uh, we didn't have proof, but there it was. I mean, literally, it, it's two houses standing next to each other. You can see the scene. Um, and we don't know why they did it that way. Um, I have theories on why, why he did it that way, as I mentioned earlier, but we just don't know. We don't know why they built it in, uh, in two, different, two different stages. I mean, it, I won't say they built it in two, in two different stages because it would have had a kitchen and a dining room and bedrooms. Basically, they added on to it. Right. They added the right, the, the big living room and uh, two additional bedrooms. It's uh, really fascinating when we actually got into the attic up there. You could see when, when they started peeling back the walls, you could see the original siding of the house, right. the original portion of the house still standing there yeah. and, and just buried in the walls. Yeah, the tar paper on literally on the, on the outside of these yeah. two Two you can see separate the, structures. The corner of the home and then the new corner and how they were uh, joined together. Um, and, and they really just are, have been coexisting so well. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was only four years difference. Yeah. But you went through so much trouble to try to find plans, right? Really um, exhausted all potential resources to try to find a, a set of the original drawings. I mean, you were at the History Center and uh, looking through you know, maps and I mean, anywhere that he could go to try to find some plans, he was looking for them. Um, and unfortunately, I, I just don't think they exist. No. Uh, you know, the, one of the cool stories about the house is that the library in the 1930s, uh, a woman by the name of um, Ms. Dickinson owned it and she was from Massachusetts and she was an antique um, aficionado and she found this library on a home up in Massachusetts that they were going to tear down. And she had that library disassembled and shipped down here by rail. And that's what's now our library. And we think it was probably a porch, probably at some point or another. We don't know, but it's, it's not original to the home. It came from a, probably a much older home uh, in New England. All right. We certainly uh, thank you guys. Any other questions anybody have? Oh. Thank you. So again, I want to thank uh, each of you uh, for putting this together. It's been uh, very insightful and hopefully uh, evangelism will help uh, uh, push a couple of people to save a house or push their kids to save a house in the Buckhead area. That's right. Hopefully so. All right. Hey, John, uh, it's Faith Pierce. I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the uh, Program and Events Committee, Buckhead Heritage, thank you all so much for doing this for us tonight. If uh, you put a lot of work into this presentation and organizing it all, and uh, uh, it's great to to be able to, that you are able to share that with us, what you went through. And it's quite a gift to the neighborhood too, to know that, that all that has been done. So, thank you, Dave. 